Welcome, everybody, to the NFL Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm your co-host for the NFL Show, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my legendary co-host, a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, Indiana Hoosier, 1981 National Champion, Steve Risley. How you doing, Steve? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how the three people that are probably listening to us are equating my basketball uh, background, turning it into a pick and show for an NFL. Well, the pickup show will be tonight at 8 o'clock with Dan Kornhauser, you, yourself, and me. And last week, of course, you did come in last, which would make it, you know, easily believable that a basketball But it was a guy close last. Play. It was a very was a close, close last. last. It was a close last. <laughs> All right, Steve, we're going to go ahead. We're going to start All talking right. about the big things that struck us this past week in the NFL. We're going to start off with the Steelers. Their demise has been greatly over-exaggerated. The defense is still very good. Minka Fitzpatrick, T.J. Watt both played really well this week. Um, the Buffalo Bills, not so much. And this is something where I think the Bills were expected to be possibly a Super Bowl team, and the Steelers were projected to be dead in the water. It didn't turn out like that in the first week, though, Steve. Not, not at all. And I still think the Steelers, or, I mean, the Bills are a Super Bowl contending team. Uh, I think first week you don't make a, a, a season-ending judgment on a team after the first week, and you know that better than me. Um, but uh, they caught a Steelers team that has probably re remanufactured itself. You know, Roethlisberger only throws for 188 yards, doesn't really set the world on fire with his air game. Uh, rushing, what they do rushing, uh, 45 yards. Out of Nate Harris, is it uh, not Nate Harris? Najee Harris. They had Najee 75 Harris. yards total. But the total. thing that strikes me here, though, Steve, is this. Big Ben last year at the end of the year where they yeah. fell apart after going 11-0, and he was throwing interceptions. This game, he was efficient. I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, and with their defense, if he's efficient and doesn't turn the ball over, they're going to be hard to beat. And I think the thing we've seen with Mike Tomlin is this. Just when you think they don't have anything to win with, Mike Tomlin is a better coach with less talent, if that makes any sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I was going to bring up the point, the two points that you just talked about was, uh, I think what set the Steelers into a, a higher gear was no turnovers in this game really for them. Uh, no fumbles uh, and, and no interceptions. They had good ball control. Like I said, Roethlisberger only throws for 188 yards, but they're, they're, they're useful 188 yards. He moved the change for this football team and put them in position to score every time. And then they got the job done. Tomlinson, are we ready to say he is one of the two or three best coaches in the NFL right now? Are we ready to go that far? Or is that still a little bit of an exaggeration? I think he's been in there for a long time. I think the questions come when he has more talent. He seems to do less. Uh, but when you look at this game, Buffalo outgained Pittsburgh 371 yards to 252 yeah. Um, total plays 79 for the Bills, 59, 55 for the Steelers. Uh, really, if you would have just shown us this game summary, we would have thought the Bills won this game by two touchdowns. And I think that's what makes the Steelers so dangerous because they can win ugly. Right. And I think that the, the, the yardage and the stats that the Bills put up is what convinces me they still are a Super Bowl team. Every team's going to make tweaks and, and, check things and checks and balances and things they need to, to alter a little bit. But for, the, for the, the Bills to come up and put up those kinds of numbers and actually play a pretty good football team, um, although they, they just ran into a typical Steeler, steel curtain defense and just, just a non-mistake offense, um, they hit a buzzsaw, uh, yet the game was at Buffalo. So, you know, they had some home field advantage there. They didn't play well, but I, I, I see this as more of a, a, a redemption for Pittsburgh than I do a really negative thing for the Bills. Every team's going to lose a game here or there. Get this thing out of the way. Know what you got to do. The problem is they're going to have to go to Pittsburgh and play Pittsburgh again. Not necessarily. They won't necessarily have to go back to Pittsburgh and play no, They're Pittsburgh. not in the same division. They only play once unless they play in the playoffs. Well, that's right. They're not. That's right. They're not. Come on, Steve. All right, That's next right. up, we got my favorite game of the week. Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. Are they Holy. in trouble? They are in trouble. I mean, to me, Aaron Rodgers looked uninterested in this game. He looked entirely uninterested. I mean, I think he's thinking the Jeopardy position 
is now open again, and he may just want to go back and do that. I mean, his hair's all grown out. He's gone Hollywood. Um, I, I don't think he has any interest in being in Green Bay. It doesn't appear that. Now, again, I hate to judge somebody's character or abilities or season off of one game, but Aaron Rodgers showed me in, in this one game that he didn't come prepared to play this game. Well, the entire um, team showed up unprepared. The offense, the defense, they were totally dominated from the start. Jameis Winston, 14 for 20, 148 yards, five touchdowns. That's a stat line you don't see very often. Alvin Kamara, 83 yards rushing. Tony Jones, 50 yards rushing. You throw in Jameis Winston's 37. This is a game that the Saints are just a better football team than the Green Bay Packers all the way around. They outgained them 322 yards to 229 yards. Uh, they forced Aaron Rodgers into two horrendous interceptions. Rodgers only threw for 133 yards. I think this tells us two things. Number one, the Green Bay Packers, and I know it's just one week, but I think by looking at the defense and the lack of running game they had in this game, the Green Bay Packers may not be very good. And the New Orleans Saints, they switched the quarterback, but they're still one of the most talented rosters in the NFL. Yeah, and, and you were harping on that, I know, when we did the Pick'em show last week. You were you were pretty well hung up on, on staying solid behind the Steelers and were claiming they were one of the better teams that had a better roster, and, and it, it boded out here. Um, I think the big question that we'll take away from this game right now is, is Jamin Winston going to be able to put this kind of leadership up every game, or at least the bulk of them? Uh, that's going to become critical. I, I mean, again not overwhelming stats in terms of player of the week, but he, he methodically got things done for this football team, played within himself, and led this football team, I thought, which was great. Um, but we've seen him at Tampa Bay where he's been anointed this this, this starting status and, and just did it for a couple games. And then just vanished. Yeah, but the so, difference is here. I mean, remember the year he led with 30 interceptions. He also led the NFL with touchdowns. And right, right. now he's yeah. playing on a team where he doesn't have to force the ball. He doesn't have to make a huge play for the team to win. He just has to st stay within the framework of the offense. And as we talked about with Big Ben, just not turn the ball over. If right. he doesn't turn the ball over, there's enough talent there. He can take the Saints to the Super Bowl. No, I – well – <laughs> of course, of course. They're, they're fighting over one dog bone. Knock it off. Well, get them too, Steve. I know. Well, they have to. The only one's in the room. All anyway, right. uh, and Aaron Rodgers has been prone to throw stupid interceptions his entire career. Um, you, you know, you've always seen Usually just two. in the playoffs, though. <laughs> okay. Well, in games that count, and <laughs> Opening 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 game of the season is always one that counts, especially against an opponent like the Saints. So uh, I think this game, we have to watch both these teams a lot in the next couple of games and see how they each manifest out. Is it was this just a non-being prepared game for the Packers? They're going to rebound, and is Jameis going to be able to keep leading this team like he needs to to utilize all? the talent on his football team. But this was a fun, good game to keep an eye on a watch. All right, next up, the Indianapolis Colts ran into Russell Wilson. It almost seemed like the 2013 Seattle Seahawks. Their defense was suffocating. They ran the ball well. And Russell well Wilson seems like every pass he throws is a touchdown, Steve. That was a fun game for you Colts fans, wasn't it? Well, I tell you what, I think uh, any any pass, any good quarterback is going to throw against the Colts is sure. Maybe a touchdown. We got Matt Stafford coming in uh, this week into Indianapolis, who is coming off a hot game um, with the Rams. Um, yeah, I, I think the story here is the Saints, or, or the Saints, I'm sorry, the Seahawks are, are a good football team. Russell Wilson is now establishing himself as the highest echelon quarterback in the NFL. He's in that elite group. I think he's moving toward that. Uh, I think he's always been just a step short of it. And maybe it's because he didn't quite have the team around him he needed to have. Oh, this is a Super Bowl winning team. Um, it, it, it uh, you know, but then I look back and what, what the Colts gave him was 
The Colts up front defensively on the defensive line are solid. They've got a solid defensive line. Their linebacking core may be as good as any in the NFL, uh, but when you get past that linebacking core, uh, it, it's over and done with. Our defensive backs are cherry-picked, ripe to be picked, however you want to describe them. And I think good teams are going to realize that, and you're going to see a quarterback like Matt Stafford who can accurately throw the ball deep, pick the Colts apart again. I think until the Colts spend some money on a solid defensive backfield, despite however good they are offensively, um, they're going to struggle. They, they're they looking possibly at being 0-3 or 1-4. and well, They're possibly 0-5 the because of the first five games. The one yeah. good thing for them, and we'll talk about it a little bit, is the Tennessee Titans completely laid an egg at home, just like the Colts did. But the thing that surprises me or really bothers me here if I'm a Colts fan, Carson Wentz played all right. But yeah. when you got Jonathan Taylor averaging three yards a carry, Naheem Hines averaging 3.8 yards per carry, that kind of kills it here. The Colts' offensive line was not the juggernaut we thought they would be, at least in game one. And to me, the Seattle Seahawks, L.A. Rams, Arizona Cardinals, San Francisco 49ers, those four teams may be the four best teams in the NFC, and they're all in the same division. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the Colts got to play them all. So yeah. they're, they're, they're in trouble. So. All right, let's talk about the Rams. The Rams bludgeoned the Chicago Bears. Matthew Stafford, I mean, Matthew Stafford was the opposite of Aaron Rodgers on Sunday night, Steve. That was a guy that looked like he was having a blast plan. I think it's because he wasn't stuck in Detroit. <laughs> well, <laughs> did not be stuck in Detroit. Always things, you know, like it's always sunny in Philadelphia. That's because you had to have come from Detroit <laughs> to get there. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Stafford fit into the offensive scheme. I think the outlook, the whole team just seemed more pumped. Now, you know, they're going to their new stadium. Uh, they're at home. They've got a new quarterback. They've wrestled and struggled with golf for years, a couple, three years. Um, they just have a whole new outlook. Uh, so it, that, that shouldn't be unexpected. The Rams inherently are a very good football team. Uh, defensively, they're as solid as anybody. Uh, Stafford does have the arm to throw the ball anywhere on the field he wants to. Short, he's accurate enough to throw the short passes across the middle, and he's got the strength to throw the deep passes as he proved. Yeah, so, we, look at the, we look at the Bears. Andy Dalton, 27 for 38, 206 yards, one interception. David Montgomery ran the ball almost seven yards per carry for 108 yards. Offensively, they didn't look bad. Um, they didn't look great. I think right now, I, I was one that thought maybe you should start Justin Fields right away, but I think that you let Dalton roll these first four or five games and then bring Fields in, but I don't think Dalton played poorly. Dalton played the way Dalton plays, which means he's a slightly above-average quarterback who can keep you in games. The problem is for Dalton to win and be successful, he's got to have a lot of talent around him. And offensively, yeah, weapon-wise, I mean, wide receiver, you had Marquise Goodman. You've got Cole Komet, Allen Robinson. I mean, that's not, you know, it doesn't blow you away when you look at that talent. You know, I watch games like this, and I look at the Bears, and I am I go, I see the NFL as a cyclical league. You know, teams, they, they rise to the top. Players decide they want more money. They leave. They retire, they get injured, and never return the same. The Bears are a football team that have been down for so long. Is this just a management problem with this football team, or what's I going think on the here? Is they never find a quarterback. I mean, you wasted three years on Mitchell Trubisky. You've wasted all kind of years on the Rex Grossmans of the world. I mean, hell, the last legitimately really good quarterback they had was who? I mean, it was Sid Luckman back in the 1940s. I mean, you had Bobby uh, Douglas. You, he you could count, run around. You, you don't count McMahon in there? Uh, Jim McMahon was a good quarterback. Yeah. But, I mean, that def that team won because they had maybe the greatest defense of all time. And they had Walter Payton, maybe the greatest running back of all time. McMahon was a good quarterback. But McMahon's career was short-lived because he was always hurt. So outside of McMahon, there's really nobody there that I think, come on, do we think Jake Cutler or Rex Grossman was the guy? I mean, their lack of being able to get a quarterback in that can win you games 
is just mind-numbing when you look. It's been like 80 years since they've had one. Yeah, it's been a while, and I, I think looking at uh, the geography around Indianapolis, being a Colts fan, at least we have a little bit of hope that things can – we have talent on that football team. I don't know if it's just enough talent to, you know, create any havoc on anybody, but the Bears, that that those poor people in Chicago – are looking at a dismal year. Uh, maybe, maybe not, because they're in the NFC North, which I think could turn into last year's NFC East right East. now. If the Packers really are that bad. you got the Lions. I think the Vikings, they could be good. We'll talk about them in a minute. But, hell, if Justin Fields was to come in five games in and play his ass off and they go 8-9, and nine, he might get them to the playoffs. So they do have the hope that Justin Fields is the man. Now, whether he is or not, I don't know. I think he could be. But I think there is hope in Chicago just because Justin Fields is there, and we really don't know what they have yet. Well, if, if that is the case, Mike, then, and, and we see how bad the Bears looked, and I don't put it on Andy Dalton's shoulders at all. I think Dalton gives you 110% every time he steps on the field. I've liked Andy Dalton from the first time he, he put a Bengals uniform on and played, and I think he labored in that environment. He didn't uh, labor. He went to the playoffs five straight years. Okay. Yeah, but still, were they really – they got to the playoffs, but were they a Super Bowl contending team? Yeah. In 2015, if Dalton doesn't get hurt against Pittsburgh in Week 13, I think the Bengals would have been in the Super Bowl. That was a 10-2 and two team. Dalton, I think, at that point was 29 touchdowns, 7 interceptions, or 27 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. Okay. It was his best year, and he got hurt because, just like Chicago, the Bengals are cursed. Let's go uh, ahead and let's well, – Let me get back to my original question and end it on this. I'm sorry. Why don't you just dump Fields in there right now? Let him take his lumps. Let him learn. I what, is the neg- that, what is the negative thing of doing that? I would say the negative is this. They played the Cincinnati Bengals this week, and I would rather play Andy Dalton than Justin Fields just in case. Justin Fields is good, so I'm hoping that they keep him in. But truthfully, when do you have I, faith in your own football I, team I, there, I start, No, it's just safer that way because Justin Fields might come ball out. But to tell you the truth, if I'm the coach of Chicago, Justin Fields would have started last week. I mean, and with Andy Dalton, you've got the best backup quarterback in the NFL. So something goes wrong. But I also know this. It's a lot easier to not lose your team if you start off with Dalton and go to Fields. If you start with Fields, you kind of got to stay with him because you can't really go back to Dalton. So once you make the switch and you go to Justin Fields or almost any rookie quarterback, you're kind of married to them for the rest of that season to see what happens because they were a first-round pick. They were picked highly in the first round. A lot's expected, so it's really hard to take that guy, start him at the start of the season, and bench him in week four. It kind of kills the whole point of everything, I think. Point well taken. I say get him in there as quick as you can and, and use it as a developmental year for for him and go ahead and play him uh, and stick with him. I mean, you're, uh, the, the Bears are not going to be a challenge to anybody this year. I mean, I would bet – when yes, we they the will. Show, they play Detroit. When we do the pick show tonight, I will bet the Bengals are favored. Uh, actually, the Bengals are three-point underdogs in Chicago. First oh, line. Okay. Well, All right, next up, we're talking about the Bengals. Joe Burrow came back, looked like he'd never missed a beat. The Bengals' defense was actually dominant, which I never thought I'd say outside of 1988. Um, the Bengals win this game 27-24. My only concern is Opie Taylor, once again, screwed to pooch. The guy is a miserable human being as a football coach and a human being. I'm not a big Zach Taylor fan. Nobody in the middle of the third quarter up 21-7 to seven when your defense is dominating goes for it on fourth and one from their own 30. That mistake right there almost cost the Bengals this game. As the next thing you know, three plays later, the Vikings are in the end zone. And then it's a dogfight from then on out. But with, with Joe Burrow... 20 for 27, 261 yards, two touchdowns. Maybe more importantly, Joe Mixon, 29 carries, 127 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, I think this is a huge win for the Bengals. If they can string two together and beat the Bears, this is a team, talent-wise, is good enough to go to the playoffs. Coaching-wise, once they get there, they're not going anywhere, though. Yeah, it, and, and with, with, with the Bengals showing potential as much as they are, and then the Steelers – coming back uh, uh, and, and playing like they're playing, you know, we're all talking about Cleveland. 
this is not going to be an easy road for Cleveland to, to, to meander down. Well, everybody talking about or, Cleveland and Baltimore or, or right or now. Or Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. And Cleveland and Baltimore exactly. are the two teams without a win right now. Yeah, they both lost, and, and they're, you're looking at – I mean, Pittsburgh looks solid. Uh, the Bengals, if they can keep him healthy, which God bless the hope we do, Burroughs is the real deal. I mean, he, he's an upper echelon quarterback in the NFL potentially right now. Uh, not waiting the usual, you know, two to three years to get these guys like we saw Sam Darnold kind of come into. I'm sure we'll get to, to the Panthers later on, but uh, you know he's he's ahead of that curve right now. Burrows is. And yeah, I think right now Joe Burrow, out of anybody that's two years or less in the NFL, I know everybody talks about Justin Herbert. I mean, uh, Joe Burrow is better than Herbert. Well, Herbert's better surrounded with with better talent. I don't think he is. And better coaching. Well, that's a no brainer. Good luck thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you look at us, you got T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, who was unreal in his first game, five catches over 100 yards and a touchdown. Um, Joe Mixon. I mean, San Diego or the Chargers do not, I don't think they have that kind of talent. And I think the Bengals' offensive line, I think, is definitely improved from last year. And yeah. the most important thing here is the defense is big time improved. And until they gave the ball up on their own 30 yard line, they dominated. So, Steve, let's get there. We're in the middle, about the middle of the show. Give me your surprise of week one. Surprise of week one. Um, I, well, I tell you what, you know, I, I wanted to say Dallas, but they didn't win. So, it really can't be a great surprise. I guess the one that, that I didn't see coming was Philadelphia, Atlanta. Um, no, wait a second. We talked about this before the show. I gave you mine, and you picked the same damn one. Well, it makes sense, Mike. I mean, uh, imitation is the rarest form of flattery. No, it's the sincerest form sincerest of Sincerest form. The rarest form of flattery. Oh, I don't know. I you never need, got You need a new book of quotes. I know I do. Or just have your wife read them to you. Uh, but I, I would think that game was a surprise. Uh, actually, actually, the Cardinals were a little bit of a surprise to me, too. Yeah, I caught a lot of crap, too, for picking them on the Pick'em Show. Yeah, you did, because we, we went uh, we went the other direction. And, All right, um, um, let's do this. I think my most interesting game of the week was the Panthers. And Sam Darnold, do you think maybe he went and warned the New York Jets quarterback after the game how bad things are going to get there? No, I think Sam got, Darnold's got too much class to do that. I think I think you're being facetious. No, I just he ought to go warn him because I mean, yeah. what what happened was in this game we saw everything that made Sam Darnold what made people believe Sam Darnold was a failure in New York, which there was no offensive line, there's no weapons to throw to, there's really no running game. Um, I, I think. Hopefully, Zach Wilson was able to talk to Sam Darnold privately after the Jets lost to Carolina because, like I said, shoddy pass protection, bad luck, defeat. That's what happens if you're a New York Jets quarterback, not named Joe Namath. He was sacked six times on Sunday, and they may be without their best offensive lineman, Mekhi Becton, for a long time now. Yeah. Yeah, I I, – I, 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 the Jets are just one of those teams where you stretch to find any kind of compliment to give that football program. And again, that's another one that has been in the tanks for so long that uh, it's hard for me to believe that they don't cycle up to the top with some draft picks or some trades or something. But uh, I'm amazed, Mike, that you're sitting here doing this show with me and you're not in management or coaching in the NFL. I don't want to. All right, next up, uh, Teddy you Bridgewater. The, you, don't, you don't want $10 million a year? No. No. Why do I want $10 million a year? That's just more problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Teddy Bridgewater in Denver. I know Dan Kornhauser on our NFL Pick'em Show said he was going to be there. They were his surprise team for this year. 
and they actually look like it is definitely possible as they handled the New York Giants and Daniel Jones. Teddy Bridgewater was 28 for 36, 264 yards, two touchdowns. Melvin Gordon runs for 101. Javante Williams runs for another 45. They have over 150 yards rushing, over 250 yards passing. And, of course, the New York Giants have Daniel Jones, who I think bumbled the ball at least once. But he had a decent game. Saquon Barkley, though, 10 carries for 26 yards. This Denver defense is good. And if Teddy Bridgewater continues to play like this, the Broncos can make a run at a playoff spot. I do believe I picked the Broncos as well as Dan. Hold on. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. That's why I couldn't use him as my surprise game of the week, although it kind of shocked me that they won. Well, yeah, anytime you're right on a pick, it's shocking. So. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, Denver just has a rich tradition, rich history. Bridgewater definitely is the key to that club. Von Miller apparently led a stellar defensive effort. Um, the team seems to always be solid. Uh, Elway, well, I know I don't think you're an Elway fan. Yes, I am as a player. Are you? Not as a not drunken as a, GM. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think he always keeps a good foundation with that football organization. And then just by adding two or three players or getting somebody like a Bridgewater to rise to the, to the level of, nest, of where he needs to be, um, I, I think Denver is always in the hunt. Every year, year and when have you ever seen Denver – just fall flat on their face and be the out of it. Three or four years, Steve. Yeah, but still, they they, they finished three in and around five hundred, didn't they? I don't think so. Okay. But we'll go ahead and get off of that. Uh, the New York or the New England Patriots got stripped. Mac Jones played well, made a couple huge throws, especially on I think it was third and five or fourth and five on that final drive before Damian Harris fumbled the ball at the nine yard line. It was a killer because they were set up to win this game. But, you know, ex-New England cornerback, now with the Miami Dolphins, Eric Rowe ripped the ball out of Harris's grab at the Miami nine-yard line. That was pretty much it. But Mac Jones looked sharp. The defense was good as advertised. I think the Patriots are contender to win this division. Oh, I do too. I, I you know, I, I think this this AFC East is is not what it used to be right now other than Buffalo. How about this? I think it's better than what it used to be because it used to just be one team. Now there's three teams that could possibly win this division. You're talking about what, Miami, New England? And, and and everybody not named the Jets. Is not named the Jets. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would agree. I would. Agree. It's going to be a little bit tougher a road in this division for Buffalo than people were giving them credit for. They're going to have to play, show up, because I, th I think that the, uh, the Dolphins um, – uh, Patriots game it was a good football game. It was fun to watch. Uh, it, it was good. It was a fairly well played game for two really young quarterbacks uh, running their offenses, uh, moving the ball, and, and it came down to one play, basically the fumble that, that that kind of took New England out of it. But by the same token, that that sealed the win for Miami. So any game that comes down to one play like that says you got two pretty balanced teams. And, and could do it, but I think the difference here is, I think Mac Jones is going to grow and grow and grow and grow under Belichick and under the, the the Patriots system, and I think he's got a better opportunity to get better quicker than does Tagli Atubu. Tagli what? I don't know. Tagli Aloha. Come on, I can't even say it. I can't pronounce words. All right, next up, the Kansas City Chiefs escaped the Cleveland Browns basically for fifty minutes. Yeah. Beat Cle Cleveland Browns Kansas gave City. them a gift. They, they didn't give them a gift. The punter did because, you know, yeah. they snapped the ball to the punter. The punter drops the ball. And that's yeah, you said that was his first punt of the season? Does it? Yeah, because, I mean, they didn't punt all day because Cleveland, Baker Mayfield, 21 for 28, 321 yards. Nick Chubb runs for 83. Um, Chubb and Hunt basically combined for around 130 yards and averaged five and a half yards per carry. The Cleveland Browns should have won this game. But Patrick Mahomes rears up, strikes him for 23 points in the second half, throws three touchdown passes, 337 yards. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire was held to only 43 yards. The things that would concern me coming out of this game are the fact that Kansas City's defense did not look very good. They did not run the ball very well. 
Actually, I come out of this game even thinking more that Cleveland has a shot to go to the Super Bowl than I did before the game. I I tend to disagree with you um, slightly. Why? I, 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 I you know for for two reasons. One, what we saw Mahomes do is Patrick Mahomes. That's yeah. how that man plays football. I mean, he plays on the cutting edge of the earth. I uh, you know, but but he 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 makes the plays. Nine out of ten times, it's not like a fluke or like a Brett Favre where you say, "Hey, mail, you know, hail Mary it up there," and whatever happened happened, and fifty percent of the time it went Brett's way. This is a guy who manufactures this stuff. I've never seen a quarterback. What does this have to do with the Cleveland Browns being a Super Bowl contender? I'm getting there. Okay. Um, it, it, I'll say this last about Mahomes. I've never seen a quarterback be able to throw the ball from so many different positions: sidearm, underarm. Over on Elway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Elway may be the last quarterback who could even do that too. Uh, but how this relates to the Cleveland is, I think that for the Cleveland to be a Super Bowl contending team, um, yeah, what's their quarterback's name? I'm drawing a blank. Baker uh, Mayfield. Mayfield uh, is going to have to calm down. He's going to have to settle down and get into a rhythm in the games. He, he's trying to play. I don't think he's intentionally trying to play like Mahomes, but I, I think he's got that same mentality of being a gunslinger uh, right now. And I think he needs to settle down. He's got so many offensive weapons uh, through the air or you know in the backfield that he needs to let the other team get involved more and be a part of the success rather than him. And I don't think he's intentionally doing it. I just think that's his style. But he's one who may need in my eyes to alter his style a little bit, slide down into the quarterback position, move the chains, and take what you can get. Until he does he, that, I think that they're going to lose these close games. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but if the punter doesn't drop the ball, they may win the game. Sure. If I mean, I, 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 all I know is this. This is September. When you get to January, the difference in this mm -hmm. game is this. It's going to be probably 20 degrees out. Running the ball is going to be highly important. Playing defense is going to be highly important. Cleveland is better at both of those things. They won this game off a of Browns special team error and basically the brilliance of Patrick Mahomes. My, my issue is when you can't run the ball against Cleveland, though, eventually this is going to catch up. We saw this last year. They barely got past the Browns in the playoffs. They barely get past them in this game. This is why I believe they are more of a Super Bowl contender than before. It doesn't mean that I think Kansas City is less of a contender, but the fact that they could run the ball. I mean, Cleveland for the game averaged eight yards per play. Kansas City averaged seven yards per play. My thing is this. I think if you get bad weather and this game's played, whether it's Kansas City or Cleveland when you get to the playoffs, I think that that is very conducive to the team that can run the ball because you can keep Patrick Mahomes off the field. I also think if you keep Jadavion Clowney and Miles Garrett healthy all year, they're going to get better as they go. They're going to be able to rush the passer better. And what we saw last year in the Super Bowl was Tampa Bay beat Kansas City because they pressured Mahomes. He didn't have time to make those plays, and he had to try to just pull stuff out of his butt to win the game. That's why I think Cleveland has a better chance. It doesn't mean Kansas City has less of a chance. I just believe more in what I saw with Cleveland because they did go toe to toe with the Chiefs for 60 minutes and just came up a little bit short. Um, point well taken, no doubt. But I also believe that while I don't think that Kansas City has the, the the running game that Cleveland does, they play in the same kind of weather. I mean, it's definitely longer cold season in Cleveland than Kansas City, but. Kansas City will, will will bite some cold temperatures on you as well. Yeah, and they won't so, be able to run the ball. That's good. Well, be but, but, but it gets to my point. I don't know that there's a quarterback who utilizes his tight ends on short yardage situations than Mahomes does. Um, well, that's and, probably and Kelsey not, back there. Actually, got, there is. There is. His so, name is Tom Brady, and the well, other one is Jimmy Garoppolo. Now, the thing you got to take away from that is this. Also, all, three be around of those guys, all three of those guys have the three best tight ends in football. Right. That has more to do with anything else. And David and Joku, I mean, 
that is a difference in Cleveland's offense. And Joku is not a bad player, but he's not one of those guys. He's not a Darren Waller, who we saw Waller had a huge hand in the Raiders upsetting the Ravens, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I, I think this, I think this is very possibly this week one matchup is the same matchup we'll see in the AFC championship game. I would say at this point, you would point to that game as being where it'll go. I, I, again, I think Buffalo's only getting better, and we'll have to see. Um, I don't put any any stock in Buffalo losing in week one. How about that? I, I do. I, I put stock in the fact that their offensive play calling is horrible. And I, I think this. I don't think the Bills are going to win the AFC East. Okay. We'll see. I may be yeah. completely wrong. They may win no, their next no. 16 Mike, games. But... Generally right in this stuff. I mean, you know. All the right. fact that I only lost to you by one game gives me eternal hope. It actually shouldn't because that means you lost. Next up, the Cardinals shocked the Titans. They didn't shock me because I told you this would happen, Steve. I told you and Dan. But the Cardinals win this game. And when you look at this, this Cardinals offense is pretty dang good. And the defense looks like it's gotten a little bit better. What's your takeaway from this? And is there any concern if you're the Tennessee Titans? Um. My concern with the Titans has always been the same. I think Tannehill's overrated. Um, I, I don't think he's – I've watched that kid since he was on hard knocks as a rookie um, with Miami and just took a liking to him uh, and, and followed him, you know, mildly throughout his career. He just never has produced game-winning plays by himself. I mean, he's always had – running backs back there, strong defenses around him, or not winning at all for the big, big part in Miami. So I, I think that the weakness that is Tannehill for for the uh, um, the Titans. I think the thing here that we talked about having the surprise game of the week, I think the eye-opening game of the week was this game because the Cardinals are good. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're Murray's a good quarterback. I mean, they, got, guy, they got weapons. I mean, if they you look, got weapons anywhere you want them to yeah. have weapons. They had Chase Edmonds and James Conner combined for over 100 yards rushing, but you had DeAndre Hopkins, yeah. six catches, 83 yards. Christian Kirk, five for 70. Rondell Moore, four for 68. Edmonds out of the backfield, four for 43. A.J. Green, two for 25. And this is a team, Isaiah Simmons really played well on defense. You got Chandler Jones. I mean, this is a team that can play just enough defense to give them a yeah. shot here. The problem is they're in the NFC West. In the Which NFC West, brutal. yeah, that division is going to be hell to get through this year and to win, but they got a shot. No, I, I, I agree. And I think that they run kind of a gunslinger type offense uh, with Connor Murray, but they run it efficiently. I mean, it doesn't look helter-skelter gunslinger. It looks efficient gunslinger in the first game. Now, let's see what they do this week and and, and go forward from there. But I, I think this is the eye-opening game of the week for me was this game. Not so much for Tennessee because I think that whole division, I mean, look, every team in the AFC uh, South lost except for the Oilers who beat the Jaguars. The Oilers? The Oilers, the Texans. Damn, you're getting worse than me now. All I right, <laughs> next up, lastly, maybe the best game of the week, the Las Vegas Raiders upset the Baltimore Ravens after being down 14 to nothing early in the game. Derek Carr, 34 for 56, 435 yards, two touchdowns. They really didn't get anything out of Josh Jacobs in the running game, but Darren Waller, 10 catches, 105 yards. Um, Hunter Renfro, six for 70. Brian Edwards, four for 81. This is a huge win for the Ravens. I still don't, or for the Raiders, I still don't think the Raiders are really a playoff contender. But my concern, if I'm the Baltimore Ravens, my leading rusher was Lamar Jackson. And that's the, I mean, they've had so many injuries at running back. I don't know if this team can recover. Um, I I think, yes, I agree. I think, I think that, Baltimore will press to make the playoffs based on Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and um, Cleveland. Cleveland. 
uh, in that. I think they'll, they'll press because they are a very one-dimensional offensive team. Um, they basically have Jackson, and that's it. Uh, yeah, and, and he, the, he doesn't the, want to throw the ball. He wants to run the ball. And know. the problem here is this. Their next game, they they host the Chiefs. Then they go to Detroit, which is all right. But then you're going to Denver. You host Indianapolis. You host the Chargers. You host the Bengals. You host the Vikings. You go yeah. to Miami. I mean, then you get the Bears, which may be an easy one. But then it's, you know, you got Cleveland coming to town. You go to Pittsburgh. You got Cleveland again. Yeah, you got the Packers. You got the Bengals. Yeah, you got the Rams. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is – their schedule's a bitch. I, yeah, I, I I can say right now unequivocally, there is no way the Baltimore Ravens make the playoffs this year. Well, I I you know I said it before you did here in this little segment that, that they're struggling. I I never you know I got to see what other teams are going to see. I got to see how much the Bengals hold up. Um, I hope they do. I'd love to see uh, Cincinnati in the playoffs. I think they deserve it. Um, I think it's nice to see you smile every once in a while. I'm not smiling. Um, but maybe if they made the playoffs, you might smile for us. No, no. Okay. I've seen them make the playoffs. You got to win. You got to win. All right. But, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. All right, Steve. Tonight, NFL Pick'em Show Week 2 with myself, you, and Dan Kornhauser. We will be on at 8 o'clock live on the grueling truth Facebook page. You can also find us live on YouTube and like 300 other different places. Uh, Steve, anything you want to say before we wrap it up? Yeah. I, I, I want to give a shout out to my uh, Dodgers who clinched the playoff spot already. Okay. All right. Well, that's big news. Not They're really. Not They're really. 40 games above 500. How are the Reds doing? Uh, the Reds actually are a half game out of the playoff spot where they would play the Dodgers, so it doesn't really matter how many games above 500 you are. And the question is, how many games above 500 are in New York or are the San Francisco Giants? Uh, they're 41 games above 500, or so 42 and go. a half. We're so two and a half go. games behind them. <laughs> so there you go. So you're not yeah. even first place in your division, neither. No, we're not. But we have two best, records, two best records in baseball. Well, good for them. Nobody cares about baseball, though, says so this is boring. I didn't it's care until I moved to LA. You don't care so now. You don't care now. Here. When's the last time you watched the Dodgers game from start to finish? Uh, last night. Played the Diamondbacks. The One, sleeping eight, for three eight, hours eight, in the middle of it does not count as watching the game from start no, to finish. No, we do because you see the games come on. Well, it was a seven o'clock game last night. I love it when the Dodgers go to the East Coast because you dive into the pool, you swim, you turn the game on the TV out, out on the by the pool, and you just play around the pool with the dogs and watch the uh, Dodgers play. All right. Sounds exciting, Steve. All right, guys. We're going right. to wrap it up. Make sure you check us out tonight on the NFL Pick'em Show live at 8 o'clock Eastern. Check us out there on Facebook. You can also get all of our shows on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, over 300 different places you can find us on the internet. So make sure you check us out. You can follow me at Grueling Truth. You can follow Steve Risley at srisley34 on Twitter. But for now, for Steve Risley, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been watching and listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.